All right. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Wow. This one and two more, um, I have to admit that uh, w- once I got about maybe five, six, seven chapters into this, I thought, what have I got myself into? Uh, this is a long haul, uh, but it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing uh, uh, for me. I, I pray that it's been a blessing for you as well. Again, if you would like to have these, uh, this series of lessons on CD uh, for a donation of, of any size, I leave that up to you. We can make that available to you just going through verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Uh, in this chapter, chapter 20, we're going to take a look at the millennium, the millennium. Uh, the tribulation is over. Uh, by this point, we'll take a look at the millennium. And as you will see, Revelation 20 doesn't have much to say about the millennium. Uh, but there are other passages in Scripture that do, and we'll kind of bring those pieces all back together again. We're also going to look at the binding and the loosing of Satan and uh, where his demise ends. Uh, finally, and uh, of course, we'll look at the great white throne judgment. So before we start, as always, let's go to prayer. Abba, we thank you for preserving your word for us. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that you've provided for us to gather together in holy convocation and uh, to uh, open up this blessed book. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that we are allowed to even understand it, uh, where so many of this would just be words on a page. Uh, This is... uh, It's living, it's breathing to us. And uh, Lord, we thank you. Uh, Lord, may we take this, especially this chapter, uh, not only as a hope uh, of the future that we have with you, but also as a warning uh, to bring this message uh, to those in our families and at the workplace and on and on that are lost and do not know you. Uh, Pierce our hearts and and our minds with this message. Uh, for your glory, for your honor, Bishem Yeshua, we pray as always. Amen. All right, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. So here we go. We first got introduced to this abyss back in Revelation 9, if you recall. What the abyss is, sometimes in your English version, uh, you may see the, the term bottomless pit. Same, same thing. It is a spiritual holding cell right now. It is a spiritual holding cell. And there are an innumerable, well, God knows, but there are an innumerable amount of very powerful, very wicked, unclean spirits that are holed up in this place. And they've been holed up in this place since the flood. Now, that opens up a whole nother can of worms, and because we've got some folks that uh, are rather new or whatnot, so I want to be able to get all of us on, on the same page. You have probably heard, uh, and it's a, it's a Christian uh, um, teaching, that those demons, uh, prior to the flood, went ahead, they possessed men, those men got together with women, uh, produced babies. These babies were some kind of giant race, kind of, I don't know, three heads, six legs kind of thing, whatever, I don't know. Uh, but all, you know, and, and it goes on and on and on. And all I, can say, all I can say is, hey, I believed in the tooth fairy at one time too. So let's, I'm going to spend like a, just a few moments just so we're all on the same page as to what, what happened or what transpired from G- Genesis 6. You can turn there if you want to, but uh, I'll, I'll be reading the, just the first four verses. In Genesis 6, you have a term, and it's in your English Bibles, it's sons of God. That's how it looks, sons of God. Uh, but, as we should know, your Bible wasn't written in English. Moses wrote in Hebrew, and Moses didn't write sons of God. He wrote B'nai Elohim. Now, B'nai... That's a pretty easy one, sons. Sometimes it can uh, be translated children, Uh, but sons, okay. Elohim, ah, well, there comes the sticky point because Elohim has three different definitions depending on context. Elohim could be God, capital G-O-D. Could be God's, small g-o-d-s, could be. Could be judges or rulers, 
All right, and you will find that Hebrew word where you see in the English judges, rulers, something like that, and you'll see that. So hermeneutics teaches us, okay, if we've got multiple definitions, then we've got to be able to look at the, at the text in order to give us, or context, in order to give us context. So we've got to figure out what that term is. What did, what was, where was Moses going? So in verse 1, he writes, Okay, now it came about, this is Genesis 6, verse 1. Now it came about when men began to multiply in the face of the land. Okay, pretty normal so far. And daughters were born to them. No problem so far. Okay, that the B'nai Elohim, ah, since we don't know enough, we're going to leave it at that, B'nai Elohim. And let's keep reading and see if we can put a, a word on this thing, Elohim. So that the B'nai Elohim saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. All right, here's what we need to learn really quick about the spirit world. Spirits, whether they be heavenly or unclean, fallen, do not procreate. They don't procreate. We are created in the image of God. The spirit world is not. Okay? They don't procreate. We were uh, created the way we are, multiply, fill the earth. That's not the job of the spirits. Spirits don't do that. Uh, they don't have DNA. Uh, they don't procreate. Uh, you can see them in Scripture taking on human form and eating, although they don't need to. They don't need to eat. They don't need to drink. They don't need air to breathe. They don't need sleep like you and I. Okay, they're spirits. Okay, living organisms procreate. Human beings procreate. The animal kingdom procreates. Uh, the vegetable world, right? Plants and, and uh, uh, vegetables and fruit reproduce themselves. Spirits do not. So let's keep that in mind as we continue. So the B'nai Elohim saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. And they took wives for themselves. Well, that's kind of, I never saw a spirit do that. Take a wife? Why would they be interested in wives? Now watch, then Moses adds this phrase. So they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Whomever they chose. So the institution of marriage was disregarded by this, these B'nai Elohim. They didn't care. They didn't care if you were already married to that woman. I'm going to take her anyway. Just a total lack of respect for the institution which God had created. Continuing. Then the Lord said, verse 3, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. So where's the, where's the anger from God going to? Is it being directed toward the spirit world, or is it being directed toward humankind? Humanity. So his spirit shall not drive with man, uh, strive with man forever because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. Verse 4. Ah, the Nephilim. Nephilim. Aha! Giants. Uh, slow down. What the English translators in your Bible have chosen to do, they took liberty to capitalize Nephilim. And whenever you and I see a capitalization, what's the first thing we think of? It's got to be a race. It's got to be a people group. Jamaican, Haitian, American, Israelite, Moabite, Egyptian, what, Nephilim. It's got to be a group of people. It's got to be a race. Not so fast. There's no capitalization in Hebrew. Now, the word is very obscure. It is a plural. The root is nephal. Now, if you unfortunately go to Strong's Concordance, it's going to show you giants. That's why you don't really go to Strong's first. Do a deep dive into the word nafal, and you will come to find that the word means tyrant. Nafal, tyrant. Nephilim, tyrants. The tyrants. So the tyrants, watch this, were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the B'nai Elohim came into the daughters of man. Oh, well, Moses is telling you, they were already there prior to whatever the B'nai Elohim were doing. They were there and also afterward. When the B'nai Elohim came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old. 
men of renown. So that's the context of what we have, those first four verses. So when we go to B'nai Elohim, what's the proper word to put in there? God, gods, or judges and rulers? Obviously, judges and rulers. So what we have is we have some tyrannical people in high positions, rulers, judges, did not care about what marriage was, did not care that God instituted it, did not have no sanctity for marriage. And in addition to what were these demonic spirits that were loose, they were, what were they perpetrating? All kinds of evil, obviously, perpetrating these acts by these tyrants, yes. To the, but it must have been so bad to the point where God said, you know, we're going to flush this thing down. We're just going to start over with Noah. Okay. So, again, if it's, if, if it's demons inhabiting people and creating a race and everything, then you've got a real problem when you get to Numbers 13 because guess what? The Nephilim show up again. Now what? So what? So the demons that God put in the abyss, what, they kind of like picked the lock and got out. They did it all over again, and then whoop, oh, 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 before the warden gets back, we better get back in there again. No. Okay, so we're talking about tyrants, rulers or whatnot. They disregarded marriage. But whatever these demons were up to, it was so bad, God has put them in this abyss, and even as you and I speak today, they're there, and they are waiting to be released. When the tribulation happens, they're going to be released. So that's the abyss. Verse 2 so this angel, and he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut and sealed it over him, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. We've been going these last three Shabbat talks, right, about uh, spiritual warfare, and, and I hope you've been with us and you've, and you've listened. Satan has no authority over you. Zero. Nada. Nilch. Nyet. Right? They have no authority over you. Demons and Satan are more powerful than you. Yes. But they do not have authority. That authority was broken at the cross. Okay? They cannot, they cannot touch you. They cannot touch you physically. Because you are washed in the blood. You have your Father's Spirit in you. You belong to Him. So they can't touch you. They can't touch you. They can't, uh, uh, they can't possess you. They can't do those things. But guess what demons do? This is what Satan does. If I can't drag you into hell, I'll bring hell to you. And I said it last week. You take ten dominoes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten dominoes. Do I have to hit the tenth one in order for it to fall? No. And that's what demons do. I don't have to touch you. All I have to do is bring hell around you. That's all. And the more unsaved people that are in your life, the more they will have effect on them. And what they do is they know how to push your buttons, especially ladies, especially as mothers and as, and as parents. They know, they know where your children are, and they know who your children hang around with, and you know what, I can get to you if I can hurt her or if I can hurt him. And those, and the people that are in your daughter's life or your son's life, what they do is they attack them and bring hell on earth to your, to your, to your, your child, your daughter, your son, your sibling, whatever. Because if I can hurt them and bring pain and discomfort and heartbreak to them, I can get to you. That's it. I don't have to hit the, I don't have to touch the 10th domino. All I got to do is hit the first one. So you got to know where the attacks are coming. Got to know where they're coming from. Okay. Now there's two ways we can handle this. We can either roll up the shirt sleeves that you watch. I'm taking on these demons all by myself. That's not a wise thing to do. Okay. Or, or you know what? You pray and go, I'm running to my strong tower. I'm going to run to my fortress. I'm going to hide behind my shield and my buckler because my God is mightier than any demon that there is. And I'm going to run to him and I'm going to find safety in him. When the storm hits, I'm going to be inside my tower and you know what? All hell can break loose around me. I will have peace inside. 
See? That's why I said earlier, there's that song, this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battle. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. That's it. That's it. When the storm hits, seek refuge. Seek refuge. And when we pray like that, when we pray, we have power with his spirit in us. And that power can come and be, and be spoken through us to these demonic spirits. You have power because you have authority over them. Do you notice how many angels did it take to bind Satan here? Did it take a hundred? I mean, we're talking Lucifer, right? The, the most powerful fallen angel there is. And how many angels did it take to bind him? One. Not even Michael. Not even, God didn't even use Michael to do this. He just took an angel, an unnamed angel, and gave that authority to that unangel. Take Lucifer, that old serpent, and bind him up. Bam. Done. That's the power you have. That's the authority you have. And so here's this angel, one angel, not even Michael, one angel takes a chain, binds up that old serpent, right? Okay, watch this. Did he like drag him? Did he like drag him off to the abyss? Did he walk? No. (laughs) Threw him. He threw. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. (laughs) In you go. Through him, through him, one angel, and he shut it and sealed it over him. So I'm sorry, Mr. Lucifer, you do not get your one phone call. No, although I'm sure there are plenty of attorneys in Palm Beach County that would love to take his case. No, you don't get that phone call, okay? So that he would not deceive the nations any longer. So in other words, you know what, Lucifer, you've been having your run of this world for thousands of years, and that day has now come to a close. Now it's the king's turn. Now it's the king's turn. Okay? After these things, he must be released for a short time. And as you'll see before the chapter is over with, it's going to be a very short time. It's going to be a very short time. So, all right. So let's talk. I'm going to teach you some Latin. Mille anum. Mille anum. Mille, thousand. Anum, year. Millennium. Don't you feel smarter now? Ooh, I know Latin. No. There's three ways to look at the millennium. Uh, the first two, in my opinion, are just absolute ridiculousness. Uh, there's what's called a, a millennialism, uh, which believes and teaches there is no millennium. It's more of a spiritualized kind of thought, figure of speech. The millennium. That's amillennialism. Uh, I've never actually met an amillennialist it, because it sounds like somebody just doesn't know how to read and study their Bible. Then you have postmillennialism that teaches that we may be in the millennium right now. We just don't know it. And at the end of the thousand years, that's when Messiah will come back. So once again, that's a strange one. I haven't met one, uh, although they're out there. And then, of course, there's premillennialism which is Bible, (laughs) okay? Now, again, what is this millennium going to look like, right? What are we going to be doing? Um, How it's going to operate? Millennium. Here we go. According to uh, Ezekiel 17, Isaiah 2, Israel will be the superpower. Israel will be the superpower. Every inch of land, every inch of land that God promised Abraham, they're going to get it. There's not going to be any more land for peace deals. Not with the king. No, no. They get their land, every inch of it. Israel would be the superpower. David, when he comes back along with us in glorified bodies, David's going to be the king over Israel. Now, Yeshua will be king of kings, but David will be the king. Okay, Isaiah 55, Jeremiah 30. All citizens will acknowledge Yeshua is the king. All citizens on planet Earth. You notice I didn't say we'll acknowledge him as Lord. Unfortunately, that's not the case. 
but all will acknowledge him as king. He is the king. So look at it this way. You may not like our current president. Maybe you didn't even vote for him, but he's the president. Okay, so Yeshua is the king, and all citizens will recognize that. Okay, Isaiah chapter 2 speaks of this. No more war. No more wars between nations. No, Yeshua won't allow that. Now, will there be rebellion? Yes. Disputes? Yes. The king will handle all that. But no more war. That's it. Romans 8 speaks about nature. Nature. No more curse. This curse, this planet will no longer be under the curse. And so uh, thorns and thistles, gone. Right? No more earthquakes. No more hurricanes, I can say it. No more hurricanes. No more earthquakes. No more typhoons. No more erupting volcanoes. None of those things. No. No. The earth is going back to the way it was during the garden. We're going back there. Back to the way it was before the curse. Okay? Animals. Animals will relate to one another just like they did prior to the curse. So they won't be devouring one another, the animals. Imagine, it's going to be weird looking at like a lion walking with a deer. You're going to see it, you know. Uh, you know who's, who's got it like a, hey, uh, Michelle, you got, you got a cat, right? Imagine your cat taking like a piggyback ride on, a, on one of these alligators down here in Florida. They're going to take like a Sunday walk together. You know, she'll just sunbathe together. They're going to hop on the little, on the alligator and just go for a walk. You know, his little legs will be walking and everything. No, no curse. No curse. Curse is lifted. Isaiah 11 speaks about this. There's also going to be a rebuilt temple. Ezekiel 40 through 48. We're, so we're going to have a temple in Jerusalem. And the Levitical priestly system is coming back with all the sacrifices Sin sacrifice, burnt offerings, peace offerings, drink offerings, everything. All nations will have to come and, and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles every year. That's the millennium, right? So we've got all these blessings coming to us, all these blessings. In addition, verse 4, then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. So again, I mentioned in Shabbat talk, 1 Corinthians 6 clearly says that in that day, Paul writes, we are going to judge the angels. Think about that. And he's not talking about the heavenly ones. He's talking about the fallen ones. So these spirits, unclean spirits, that have brought pain to your life and tears and suffering and stress and heartbreak, you get a chance to meet them and judge them. Yes. You get the chance. To, yeah, he, Joey's over here looking forward to it. I can't wait. We're going we're gonna to meet these guys. Yeah, we will judge the angels. In addition, we're going to be given responsibilities. Responsibilities. And so the question becomes, well, what responsibilities am I going to have? Depends. Depends on what you're doing now. The choice is yours. See, God wants you to be a good steward with what he's given you, whether it's time, talent, or treasure. And if you're a good steward now and you're responsible with what he's given you now, then he will give you responsibility in the kingdom. But if your life is all about me and about I got to go to work, I got to make money, I'm going to make pay my bills, I'm going to live in comfort, uh, all, and it's just about me, and hey, I'll show up on shul on Saturday, I'll go to church on Sunday, punch the time clock, and I got to get back to work again. Hey, then when it comes time for responsibilities to be, to be handed out in that day, the king's going to look at you like, I got nothing for you. You're here, and that's going to be an embarrassing day. Okay, how responsible are you here? This is a dress rehearsal for what you're going to do in the kingdom. Okay, he will hand out responsibilities then just as he hands them out now. No difference. Continuing verse 4, And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Yeshua and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand, and they came to life. And reign with Messiah for a thousand years. So 
it's not only going to be us and those who are raptured, but all those saints during the tribulation that lost their lives because they accepted Messiah and they were beheaded. And they're coming back too with us. Verse 5, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. So we have all the saints who've passed away from Adam to the trumpet. Okay? We have all the saints. Now, they're coming, we're, they're all, we're all coming back, glorified bodies. Then you've got resurrected, uh, or I should say raptured saints, right? Coming back, glorified bodies. We've got tribulation saints that lost their lives, were beheaded for their faith. They're coming back, glorified bodies. But the unsaved, no. No, not yet. No resurrection yet. They remain in the graves. The souls remain in Hades. Wait. Verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. Yeah. Second death has no power. So your spirit died once. But then in came his Holy Spirit and did a work inside of you and renewed you and you're born again, you're alive, your soul is alive. It's fresh, like the song, the chains fell off, now I'm free, okay? You're not going to die again. There is no, that's why Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 15, 55, oh, death, where's your victory? <laughs> oh, death, where's your sting? If I die, right? If I die and, and you hear the news, hey, Harold rose and died, the body is just going to be laid in the grave for a short time. That's all. It just goes to sleep because my soul will be in glory. My soul will be in glory. Uh, interesting question. Actually, it was asked to me again earlier this week. I said, well, what about like bodies not recovered, right? Uh, the World Trade Center bombing. They, they never recovered those bodies and all. And people lost at sea and so on and so forth. Here's the thing about it they may not have been able to recover the bodies. You ready? God knows where all the atoms are. See, the atoms were never destroyed. You may not have been able to recover the bodies, but the atoms still exist. If someone's lost at sea, perhaps, they drown, become fish food. In all honesty, let's talk realistically. They could become fish food. The, the, the body goes through the fish's digestive system out as far as waste and everything. But the atoms still exist. And so God knows where all the atoms are. You could have atoms in the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Indian Ocean. After all these years, guess what happens when the trumpet sounds? All together. Twinkling of an eye. He's going to bring everything back together again in the twinkling of an eye. That's why we say, you know, like the greatness of our God, right? Man, awesome. Awesome. He sees, he sees everything. He knows where the atoms are located in the water. Verse 6, and they will be priests of God and of Messiah and will reign with him for a thousand years. So we have God the Father on the throne in heaven, God the Son on the throne here on earth. God, God reigning on earth. Verse 7, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. So the millennium is going to come to a close, okay, and Satan will be loosed from his prison, and he's going to go out and deceive the nations. Why? To prove to you exactly what I said last week, that even in a perfect world with a perfect government, right, no curse, a perfect earth, and a perfect king on the throne, and there's still going to be rebellion and sin and wickedness in people's hearts because even a perfect earth and a perfect government cannot change the heart. It never could. And that's going to prove it once and for all. Again, 
you may think, well, wait a minute. Well, it's not us. No, it's not you and me. We're in glorified bodies. But remember, those that saw Messiah at the end of the tribulation, Israel, okay, they continue to live and live 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, four, and they're producing children. And those children have to come to faith exactly like you and I came to faith. There'll be children in the, in the kingdom. They have, and they'll be growing up, and they will have children. And the earth will multiply to the point where you see here, there's enough unbelievers on planet earth that he says the number of them is like the sand on the seashore. So even in the millennium, we have unbelievers all around us. The heart of man. That, that's why you get, it's, it can be frustrating. You know, we, we see these you know, mass shootings in our country, right? Whether it's El Paso, whether it's Dayton, whether it's, it's, it's Parkland or Orlando or Reno and on and on. And, and you know, it's like here, here's these, these highly paid uh, uh, politicians, and, 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 and liberal college professors and political analysts and everything. Like that. And all they got for us is, well, you know, we just need, you know, gun, lo- gun control laws. We got to have, we got to invest more money in mental illness now. And it, folks, the country is dying from spiritual cancer. Okay, it's spiritual cancer. And you can't cure spiritual cancer with a physical remedy. It's impossible. It's impossible. Gog and Magog. Now, he's not speaking of Ezekiel 38 and 39 here. Okay. Gog. John is using terminology that would be very familiar with his readers of the day. First century Jewish literature. Gog was simply a term which meant nations that rebel against God. That's, it's a generic term, and that's what John is using here. Gog. Nine. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth, and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. So isn't it, it's amazing that it's kind of like, even at the end of the millennium, wouldn't somebody say, hey, you know what? This didn't work a thousand years ago, (laughs) right? I mean, didn't we try this before all of us got together to try and take on God? It didn't end so good back then. But you know what? Think times change. Maybe we can like, you know, new technology or something. We're going to try this thing again. And so they're all going to come up against Israel and Jerusalem again. And verse 9 tells us, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Poof. Like I said, this isn't going to be drawn out very long. He's going to deal with this quickly, very quickly and efficiently. Verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet also are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Here it is. Keep this in mind as we battle spiritual warfare. Okay? Satan knows the Bible very well. The demons know the Bible very well. In fact, I'm almost fr- I'm afraid to say it. The demonic world knows the Bible better than most born-again Christians. They know. And so guess what? They know this chapter. The demons and Satan, they know this chapter. They know where their end lies. There's no redemption for them. And so they're going to bring as much hell to you as they can because they know this verse. He doesn't care, Satan. Doesn't care how often you come to shul or how often you read your Bible or how often we get together and pray or say could care less just don't tell anybody because once you share that gospel with somebody lost you're trying to take a family member out of their family and pull it into ours and you just put a bullseye on your back see they know their end there is it's a false uh, 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 doctrine it's called annihilationism annihilationism and it teaches this that everything or anything at the end that gets thrown to the lake of fire just ceases to exist it's like poof done we continue on in the eternal state but they just end it just ends for them it's called annihilationism look at verse 10 again 
and they will be tormented day and night. Now, first off, remember, once we get to the New Jerusalem, as you'll see next week, there is no day or night because there is no sun, there is no moon, okay? So day and night is a term, meaning all the time, day and night. They will be tormented all the time, day and night, forever and ever. So John, in his apocalypse here, does not teach annihilationism. Daniel, in Daniel 12, does not teach annihilationism. Many of those who are asleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. It never ends. Everlasting contempt. Matthew 3.12, John the Baptist said the lake of fire is an unquenchable fire. Yeshua in Mark 9.43 says hell is an unquenchable fire. It never ends. It just continues forever and ever. Revelation 14, John wrote, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on their forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. I wish, I really do, if, if I let my emotions take over, my emotions tell me annihilation, annihilationism is real. My emotions tell me that because I don't want to think of family members and friends that I love dearly who will be cast into this. Emotions tell me it can't happen. The Bible says it will. And that's why you always take emotions out of it. Do not lean on your own understanding. It's an everlasting torment. Verse 11, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. So as believers in the Messiah, you and I will appear at the judgment seat of Messiah and we will give an account for all of our actions, all of our deeds, the things that you have done and the things that you didn't do or should have done. And I will do that as well, okay? And my, my you know, if you got an attorney, he's not going to help you, okay? It's just, it's you and the Lord. So we're going to give an account. And, and I, I want to say that's going to be a good day, and yet it's going to be an embarrassing day. But unbelievers are going to have to do the same thing, but not at the judgment seat. It will be at the great white throne. At the great white throne. And they will give an account as well. He says, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away. Why would they add that? Because unbelievers who don't want to have anything to do with God, they worship earth and what earth can provide. My money, my wealth, my riches, my position, my... Uh, my standing, my family, my, my home, my car, my yacht, my vacations, my portfolio, my 401, all these things. That's what's important. And you know what? They're hiding amongst those things from God. And they're hiding in their wealth. And this verse says, guess what? No more hiding. Earth and heaven have fled away. You are out there all by yourself with God. Verse 12, and I saw the dead the great and the small standing before the throne and books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. You see that the great and the small. So it doesn't matter if you're residing in the presidential house or the governor's mansion or if you live under a bridge. Doesn't matter. Does, doesn't matter if you're rich, if you're poor. Black, white, small, short, whatever. Doesn't matter. The great and the small. And books were open. Uh, that's interesting. Because like, I'm like, okay, what books? Well, obviously, right, John 12, I believe 48, says that the Bible will judge people. So the Bible is going to be one of those books. He's going to have it. God's going to have the book, the Bible, opened up. He's also going to have the book of their deeds 
the dastardly deeds, the wickedness and everything that they have done or the things that they should have done and didn't. So that book will be there as well. And then the book of life. The book of life. Because now he opens the book of life and he shows them, look, your name's not here. Your name's not in this book of life. The, this book contains my family, my sons and my daughters, and you're not in there. I don't know you. Verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. That's an interesting verse, because why would John add, and the sea gave up? But remember his audience, okay? Remember, pagans as well as the, the, the Hebrew people, right? Uh, they took great care in how a body was disposed. Uh, the pagans would either, either bury them, burn them, what have you. For the most part, Hebrew people always uh, buried their bodies, okay? But then there was a first century thought, a Jewish thought, was what happens to those who are lost at sea and drowned? And they become fish food. And there was a thought, first century, well, maybe they don't take part in the resurrection. John clears that mess up. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. So there's no hiding. He knows where all the bodies are. He knows where the pieces are. Okay? So everyone, whether it's the, gra whether it's the grave, whether it's the urn, whether it's the sea, they all give up the dead to face the judge. And death and Hades gave up the dead, which were in them. And so Hades, in addition, gives up what? The souls. So the graves, the urns, the sea all give up their bodies, give up the bodies, and Hades gives up the soul. Verse 14, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So again, Death claims the body. Hades claims the unsaved soul. Both were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, which is outer darkness. It is eternal torment. It is everlasting separation from God forever. And it, and it seems harsh, and it seems like this can't be, and yet... But this is what the unbelievers want. This is what the earth dwellers want. They don't want God. They don't want Messiah. They don't want atonement. They don't want salvation. They want separation from God. And that's exactly what God will give them. Separation. You will be separated me for, forever. And finally, verse 15, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And so what we've already found out is this lake of fire burns forever it burns forever i i wish if i let my emotions take over this can't be real and yet it is and yet it is so in conclusion you may think when we get to this great white throne like why i mean why you've got pr just prior to this you've got right you, you've got the the millennium has come to a, conclu a conclusion we're in resurrected bodies right the Antichrist, he's in a lake of fire. The false prophet, he's in a lake of fire. Uh, um, uh, uh, the the uh, uh, death and Hades, they're thrown in a lake of fire. Right? Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. It's all in a lake of fire. So why? Why a great white throne judgment? Because God must deal with sin. At this point, without the great white throne judgment, sin has not been dealt with. And as you see, when we get into the next chapter, we're going into the New Jerusalem. And we can't enter into the New Jerusalem unless sin is finally eradicated forever. And so there you have where all the unbelievers, those not found in the book, and this unholy trinity and death and Hades and all of it is just cast away forever. And we're in the New Jerusalem. In the New Jerusalem, no sun, no moon, no stars. It's... it's it's, I, I've looked at this, not that I haven't read it before, but I looked at it earlier this week, and I'm telling you, uh, it's a challenge to put this message together. It's a challenge for me. Um, I, I'm looking forward to it, but it's a challenge to put this together. 
So let's pray. Abba, we do thank you. We thank you, those of us that can come before you and call you Father. We are in your family. We're in the family of God. We, our names have been written in your book. For that we are thankful. We didn't earn it, and we certainly don't deserve it. But you, by your grace and your mercy, you've done that for us. Lord, we, we long for the day when we will be with you, when we'll see you as you are. Uh, we, we long to see this uh, uh, earth without a curse. Uh, we, we long to see what Adam and Eve saw. What did they see? Uh, we, we look forward to that day, Lord. We look forward, we should look forward to that day when you'll be handing out assignments to us and responsibilities to us. Lord, I pray that maybe there's some here that just, hey, you know what, I, I've been too, so concerned with my life and, and with my, my own affairs that I just haven't taken my spiritual walk that, that, that seriously. I pray, Lord, that we come before you and, and even as, as we approach the holy days, Say, Lord, I, I just need a cleansing. I, I, just, I just need, we need to turn this thing around. And, and I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start living my whole life for you. I, I'm going to go to work for you. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play for you. I'm, I'm going to raise my family for you. H- help us to do that, Lord. Uh, it's a challenge. In, in, a, in a fallen world, it's a challenge. But we call upon your spirit to give us that power. We already have authority. We thank you, Lord, for the future that you have for us. What a blessed time it will be. Bless those that are here that have uh, uh, been with us and and been with me during throughout this entire lesson with just a few more chapters to go as we look ultimately at what you have for us in the new Jerusalem. Lord, bless us in spite of us. In Yeshua's name, we ask all these things as always. Amen. Lord, we thank you.